job on the job, you hand out mail. Electrical work, the carpenter work, the plumbing work, you fix the car, the whole thing for the Lord's glory the best you can. You arrest them for the Lord. <laughs> I mean, say, uh, you're doing it, you say, why? Because he did wrong. He did wrong, he's arrested because he shouldn't be done wrong. And if you let everybody do all the wicked stuff they do, the more wicked stuff they would do. <laughs> so you arrest them for the Lord, Dennis. <laughs> and say, in the name of the Lord, uh, in the jail you go. <laughs> So it's done in your heart for the Lord. Amen? So uh, Revelation chapter 2 and uh, verse 3. For thy name's sake, and hast labored. You labor for the Lord. You labor for Him. You work for Him. And hast not fainted. The fainting is quitting. That's true anywhere in the Scripture. Some folks give up and faint. They get weary. They quit. And the burden's too much. They get tired and they quit. Now he's bragging on them. You haven't fainted. Thou hast not fainted. So he's bragging about this church of Ephesus. All right. Nevertheless, okay, now they do have a problem. Nevertheless, in spite of the good things about it, they do have some bad things. And that's true with, with you as a Christian. You have some good things. And that's what you ought to go on. But you've got to pay attention, you've got to beware, because you may have some bad things too. Now what is their bad thing? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Underline that, because that can be the same way with a Christian. Those uh, tribulation saints, some of them, have left their first love. Now what is it? doesn't mean that they give up altogether and quit altogether, they just have a bad point. They left their first love. Now, that's true with a Christian. Now, take your Bible and turn to some verses. First of all, turn to Romans chapter 8, and let's pick up the word love. In one sense, you don't completely quit loving the Lord. You don't completely quit loving Him, because you do love Him a sense. Even when you get backslidden out of fellowship with Him, you still love Him to a certain extent. You know, the, Christ, the worst Christian in the worst state he's in, completely out of fellowship, still loves the Lord to some extent. Come on. You've, you've had times when you was real close to the Lord and sometimes when you was real far away. It, it has to do with a lack of love, but you still love Him. Now here, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, is you have a certain amount of love, and every Christian has a certain amount of love for the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together to good to them that love God. And that's every Christian on the face of this earth. Loves God to some extent. Now how do you know that? To them which are the called according to his purpose. Underline the word called. Now let's read verse 30. Moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called. So the called is every Christian that gets saved. Every man who trusts the blood of Jesus. So everybody loves Jesus to some extent. So Romans 8.28, when it says to those that love God, it's every saved man on the face of this earth. Now, take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John and uh, look at this thing about loving Jesus uh, like you ought to love him. Uh, turn to John chapter the Gospel of John, and turn to John chapter uh, 8, I believe it is. And well, I, I've forgotten my notes now somewhere. There's a thing on, uh, can't, uh, you might help me out with this computer, Gary. Uh, I'm looking for where he says, uh, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Uh, If you love me, you keep my commandments. In John chapter 8 somewhere, I believe. John 14, 15, I 
didn't realize it was that late over there. John 14, 15. All right. If ye love me, if ye love me, keep my commandments. All right. Then uh, some Christians don't necessarily keep his commandments, but they are still saved. Come on. Some of them don't necessarily keep his commandments, but they're still saved. Now look at John 14, look at verse 23. Watch it again. Jesus answered and said to them, If any man loves me, he will keep my, what? Words. So uh, that can allow uh, some space for a Christian where he doesn't quite love the Lord like he lo loves the Lord, because there are some verses he don't, he don't keep. He don't keep them. He disobeys some of them. There's some of the Bible you disobey. Thou shalt not covet. Come on, folks. <laughs> uh, thou shalt not bear false witness. See, at times we don't keep God's word. It has to do with a lack of love. If you loved him like you ought to love him, you wouldn't do some of the things you do. Now, here's the verse that really makes it clear. So when he says you've left your first love, Sometimes a Christian uh, doesn't love the Lord like he ought to love him. Uh, look at, uh, look at, uh, well, I've lost the verse now. It's in John where he says to Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? It's at the end of the book of John. It's in John chapter 21. Where is it at? John 21 verse 15. Now this verse will show you that uh, it's a lack of love. It's a lack of love. You can love the Lord, but you don't love Him like you ought to love the Lord. Somebody says, "Well, I'm saved. I love the Lord, yes, but you don't love Him. You don't love Him like you should." So you get it's like the tribulation, like Revelation says, you you can lose your first love. Twenty-one fifteen, uh, John chapter twenty-one verse fifteen says. So when they dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, he's talking to Simon Peter now, Simon, son of Jonah, now watch it, lovest thou me, now look at that next word, what does he say? More, more than these. So lovest thou me, he didn't say lovest thou me, he said lovest thou me more. Now why did Jesus say that to Peter? Because Peter denied him. Peter denied him up there and cursed and says, I don't even know him. So the Lord says, uh, love me more than these? So the answer is, yes, I do, Lord. Uh, I do love you, but uh, how much do you love him? Do you love him enough to do certain things you ought to do? You love him enough to get rid of some sins in your life that you could keep there and still be saved and go to heaven? Do you love him enough to get rid of some of them? If the Lord laid it upon your heart to quit a sin, would you say, Lord, I love you, so I'll quit it? <coughs> well, if you love somebody, don't you want to do something for them? Usually. I, I Sometimes you don't do real good. Yeah, sometimes you don't do real good. I bought my wife some flowers today, and I come home with them and got to looking at them, and they were pretty rough flowers. <laughs> But the intent was correct. <laughs> I'm just not real good on flowers. <laughs> they were probably too cheap. <laughs> you get what you pay for. <laughs> now, if I'd have bought some real expensive ones, they should be good. Amen? But the, the, the motive was right. <laughs> the motive was right. When you love uh, somebody, you want to do some things for them. So if you love Jesus Christ, you want to do some things for him. I don't mind doing things for my children. Now, you know, if my children right now, if they would ask me to do something, I'd put in there do just anything that I could do for them, if I thought it would really help them. Now, sometimes uh, things won't help them. Sometimes you can't do things. They may ask me for a new car. Forget it. <laughs> you ain't getting one because <laughs> there ain't no money there. But, I mean, there are some things I could do. If he was broke down said, Dad, come help me, I'd go help him. I pulled him out of the ditch about ten times last year. <laughs> I mean, went, over, went plumb across town, dropped everything I was doing, went over there and pulled him out of the ditch. And I, I did it with a happy note, too. I, was, I, I didn't 
get on his case. I didn't say, man, you're stupid running in the ditch. <laughs> I thought it, but I didn't say it. <laughs> but uh, I thought, now, what are you going to learn to drive? <laughs> so if you love somebody, you'll take care of them. So uh, there's several of them. I, I wasn't able to find all my cross-references on, on a love. Uh, there's one, uh, Gary, in that computer, give me one where it says, uh, if you love not the Lord Jesus Christ, you're anathema. If you love not the Lord Jesus Christ, you're anathema. You know what the word anathema means, don't you? It means cursed. It means cursed. Give me the cross-reference. Uh, Gary, it's in uh, First or Second Corinthians. If you love not the Lord Jesus Christ, you're anathema. First Corinthians fifteen twenty two, sixteen twenty two. All right, take your Bible and turn to First Corinthians chapter sixteen, and look at verse twenty two, and watch this thing about loving the Lord. First Corinthians sixteen, verse twenty two. If a man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, if a man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be what? Anathema. Anathema. You've heard the Catholic Church put anathema on folks, and that's a curse. Now, who's it talking about then? Talking about an unsaved person. An unsaved man does not love Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 5, verse 42. Here it is again. Turn back to John chapter 5, and it'll match this one over here where it says, If a man loves not Jesus Christ, he's anathema. Look at John 5, 42. This will clear the thing up. John chapter 5, verse 42. But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. See that? John chapter 5, verse 42. Uh, but I know that you have not the love of God in you. That's an unsaved person. That's not a, not a Christian, not a saved person at all. It's an unsaved person. That means he doesn't love God. Does it mean God loves sinners? Sure, God loves sinners. See, it's not that God don't love those unsaved people. It's that God don't love, they don't love God. See, the, so the love of God there is what? Their love for God. Not God's love for them. God loved them enough to die for their sins in the cross of Calvary. Amen? So he loves them at the cross of Calvary. Loves them enough to die for them. So it's their love for God. That thing will go either way. Either way, as I've told you before. So here, in the, where it says, if you love not the Lord Jesus Christ, you're anathema. It's if you're lost and you're not saved, you don't love the Lord, you've got a curse. So it's not a Christian whatsoever. All right, now, so a Christian, back to Revelation chapter 2 now. So when he said he left their first love, what happened to them? They got cold. They were, when they first got saved, they were in love with the Lord and excited, and it was a, a great experience, and they was just up on, you know what it's like. <laughs> Come on. And when you first got saved, you wanted to read the Bible. You know one of the signs I knew I got saved? When I opened up the Bible, I didn't get a lump right there in my throat. Because the Holy Spirit said, read. And I didn't get a lump. I used to get a lump so big that it choked me to death. And I started bawling when I heard the word greed. I'd almost bawl when I heard the word read. And I was 21 years old. I, I put in there, it, it was 22, 23, 24 years old before I could hear the word read and, and wouldn't get bothered with it. And the Holy Spirit said, read. And I would open up the Bible, and man, it didn't bother me. I knew something took place. But it has to do with the love, love of the Bible. I, God give me a love of the Bible, and he gives you a love of the Bible when you got saved. Your attitude towards this book changed. Revelation chapter 2, verse, uh, they left their first love. Now verse 3, what to do about it? First thing to do about it, if you want to get right with God, this is what you do. Number one, you do what? Write down a number one in the margin of your Bible and write this word in the margin of your Bible. Remember. Remember. So what do you have to do, folks? You have to go back to the place of departure. Write that in your notes. You have to go back to the place of departure. God never left. You did. you got to find that place where you messed up and you've got to deal with the controversy between you and the Lord 
It's usually some controversy got between you and the Lord. You got mad at God about something. You have to go back to that place and say, Okay, Lord, I got mad at you ten years ago when some preacher preached on my sin. And then I said, That's his opinion. Walk out the door and say, I'm going to do it anyway. And then you quit the church. There have been many a Christian walked out that door and got mad at me, some sin I mentioned. They got a conviction about it and quit and never come back again. You say, how do you know? I know the way people talk. They argue about the, the problem. So remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. That's the first step you have to take. Number two, what do you do? You repent. Number two, you repent. You say, you mean to tell me, preacher, I have to repent? I'm already saved. No, a Christian has to repent too. You say, what's repenting? Bawling and crying and weeping and say, God, I'm sorry. That's repenting. And saying, I'm not going to do it anymore. That's repenting. Saying, God, I'm going to stop. That's, that's repenting. Changing your heart and mind about it. That's repenting. Now, if you're going to argue about whether it's right or wrong, forget it. You didn't repent. All right. And do what? Do the first works. So underline the word, do the first works. That's the third thing you've got to do is do your first work. Now, if you're not willing to do something about it, then just stay in this place that you're at. But you've got to do something. Now, what did you do when you first got saved? What did you do when you first got saved? Did you start memorizing scripture? Did you start witnessing? Did you start praying? Did you start going to church? Didn't you do, didn't do the same thing you did when you first got saved? That's how you get right with God. Do thy first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou what? Repent. So it has to do with love. Now take your Bible and turn to Matthew 24. You should have these in your notes. But turn now and look at the verse. Matthew 24 and see the great cause of why most Christians get messed up. Matthew chapter 24 and it's true in the church age as well as the tribulation. Matthew 24 and verse 12. Matthew 24, 12. Brethren, love has a lot to do with it. What do you love? What do you love? Matthew 24, verse 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound. Now, is iniquity abounding? Sure is. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Do you know why people get messed up? They start looking at everybody else and they say, So and so and so and so and so and so, my brother, my sister, my aunt, and then so and so, and pretty soon here's a bunch of people that you love are getting messed up and pretty soon you better be real careful you'll get messed up just like they do sure the love of because iniquity abound the love of many shall wax cold revelation chapter 2 now revelation chapter 2 and let's pick up uh, the uh, next thing but verse 6 but this thou hast so he brags about them and then he tells them a negative point. Now he's going to brag about them again. But this thou hast, thou hatest, hatest, underline it. So these Christians are good because they hate something. He's bragging about it. Say, I like you folks, you hate something. I like a hater. Okay, think about that a minute. God likes a hater. Because I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God hates things too. Some folks don't know that about God. They think God is love. Big, great, big old kiss. God hates some things. Now what does he hate? He hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now right in the margin of your Bible, Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. And watch this Nicolaitan show up again. Verse 15 says, uh, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. He says it again, I hate them. So here it's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and over there it's the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So they started doing it until it become a doctrine. Now the question is, what is a Nicolaitan? Now what you got to get is this, Nicol. Take it and get in your notes somewhere. You got to separate the word Nicol and Laetan. 
The word comes from laity. Laity. Now, how many of you know what laity is? The clergy and the laity. No, it's not us. No, absolutely not. No. <laughs> but that's the doctrine that's taught. It's taught that you're the laity and I'm special and I'm different than everybody else. And I'm something you've got to treat me with respect. You've got to treat me a certain way. You've got to treat me a certain status and I'm way up here. And I'm the clergy and you're the laity. Now do you get it? I don't teach you that. I teach you I'm a sinner just like you are. I'm in the same boat you're in. <laughs> I'm a man, I am walk on two legs, and I'm a sinner just like you. You've heard me time after time saying, I fail and I'm a sinner and I'm not any different than you are. But you know what happened to a guy? He'd get to the place saying, you're the laity, and I'm the clergy, and therefore there's a great difference between me and you, and I'm on a status we appear, and I, I get all this here glory and pomp and all this stuff. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Next thing you know, you're going to be putting yourself in a place that God hates. Because you know what happened? Then I'll be lording over the heritage. Then I'll say, wait a minute, I'm the clergy, you're the laity. You've got to treat me with certain things, and then I get certain benefits. And uh, the preacher starts saying, uh, double honor is double pay. So he gets his whole congregation and divides that congregation up and says to the congregation, I'm the pastor, so therefore I get double the amount of pay that any man in this church gets happening right now, I can tell you the guy's name. And he's a Baptist. He ain't a Catholic. Who is he? Who is he? <laughs> no, no, I ain't gonna tell you. But uh <laughs> but I'm no I ain't gonna tell you. But uh the Catholic Church teaches it and the Catholic Church goes around and he puts a rule on, walks around with a white collar on and says call me father. And then the guy that runs the whole show, show says, call me Holy Father. The word Holy Father occurs one time in the Bible. You know who Holy Father is in the Bible? God. Write it down. Holy Father occurs one time in the Bible, and it's God's name. You know what it is? That's pretty close to blasphemy to call a man Holy Father. Pretty close to blasphemy to call a man Holy Father when it's God's name. So they got this thing going, Reverend. <laughs> Do you know Reverend in the Bible is found one time and it's God's name? I don't like people calling me Reverend. Now, pastor, yes, because I pastor a flock of sheep. I'm a shepherd. Peter's called a under-shepherd. Jesus is called a sheep shepherd. So I am a shepherd. So you call me a pastor. Yeah, I, I pastor. Or a preacher. <laughs> I am a preacher, man. I preach, brother. I preach the gospel. I preach a whole bunch of things besides the gospel. When you walk out that door, man, some Christians are going out saying, wow, what was that? You preach all kinds of stuff, but I get preached at. So if you call me preacher, or you call me pastor, okay, but not reverend, and not clergy, and not, oh, forget, God forbid, father. The Bible says, call no man upon this earth your father. Because there's one Father which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 23 verse 9. So uh, you need to know the word that means Nicolaitan. Nico means to rule over. Nico means to rule over. Laetans means to laity. To rule over the common ordinary man. To rule over them. That's why we have deacons and trustees to make the decisions in this church. And many a time, many a time, they said, well, Pastor, don't you think we ought to wait on that? Yeah, we'll wait. And I try not to just say, I want it this way. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I think that's just garbage. Amen? So that's the doctrine the Lord hates. And if you want to have the thing down real pat and real clear, study the Roman Catholic doctrine of the clergy and the laity. You want, to, you want to know what it is, study the difference between the clergy and the laity taught by the Roman Catholic Church. But a Baptist can sure get close to it. Some I know some Baptist preachers just pow, so proud that it's just pathetic how proud you can be. You can get proud. 
evangelist? Yeah. Yeah. Here's a guy that's driving a Mercedes Benz in a Cadillac, and his people are so poor they can't even make their bills that week, that month. Yeah, some of them Pentecostal people can't even make their bills, brother. And he's driving a Mercedes Benz and a and a, yeah, and living in a house and make millions of dollars. Hey, man, you can't even spend that kind of money. What are you buying? I mean, you've got a car and a house and clothes and food. And what else you going to want, man? I don't. I can't understand what he wants. I don't know where. I don't know where that guy's at. I really don't. What in the world is he doing? Well, he just thinks the more you got, the more you get, the more you want. The flesh is never satisfied. This flesh here is never satisfied because the more you get, the more it wants. It's got a million dollars, it wants two million dollars. But that's this. That ain't the Holy Spirit. That ain't God. It's not the Holy Spirit. You say, how do you know it's not? He said, having food and remnant therewith, be content. That's how come I know it's not. If God didn't mean that, he wouldn't have said it. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And uh, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit, say in the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear, saith in the churches. Now he says that to all seven churches. All seven churches get that. Now here's the first church he says it to. Now uh, look at the church of Smyrna in verse 8. Go down to verse 11. He that hath the ear, let him hear with the Spirit, saith unto the churches. That's the second church. The third church in verse 12, uh, Pergamos. Uh, look at verse uh, 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit, saith in the churches. So he says it into that one. Now look at uh, the church of Thyatira in verse 24. Look at what he says in verse 29 to that church. He that hath the ear, let him hear with the Spirit, saith unto the churches. It's a capital S, Spirit, Spirit, Spirit. That means it's what? The Holy Spirit. So... It says, all seven churches, so without a shadow of a doubt, brethren, the Holy Spirit is in the tribulation. And you got it? It says it to all seven churches. It's a capital S. It says, let him that heareth hear with what? How is he supposed to hear? With the Spirit. That means he's supposed to have an ear with the Holy Spirit inside of him. And he's supposed to listen with the Holy Spirit that's inside of him. Right there in the tribulation. Alright, uh, back to uh, Revelation 2. And uh, verse uh, 7. Said unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Now here we go. We went over that tree of life before. Now that tree of life is not eternal life. And you and I already got eternal life. That's eternal life to the tribulation saints. So write down the cross reference. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. So they have to overcome the mark of the beast. In order to eat of the tree of life over here. At the end. So the tree of life is also found back here in Genesis chapter 3. So the tree of life is there in Genesis chapter 3. And it's, it, the tree of life is given to them that overcome in the tribulation. They'll be able to eat of the tree of life over here at the end. You follow that? Now, the key verse. Turn to Genesis and watch the key verse. So you'll know without a shadow of a doubt that eating of the tree of life is for them to live forever and get eternal life. You and I get eternal life when we receive Jesus Christ by faith. Simple faith. No overcoming the mark of the beast for you and me. Uh, Revel uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat... And do what? Now, all they had to do was eat of the tree of life and he'd live forever. You know what that is? That's pure works. Ain't no faith involved. All they had to do was eat of the tree of life and he'd live forever. 
but he didn't. But if he would have, he'd live forever. So what does a tree have tree of life have in it? It has eternal life. And you'll get it if you overcome. But you're not Revelation Saints, so it's not aimed at you. <laughs> Revelation chapter two and verse seven, which is in the midst. Now where is the tree of life? It's in the midst of what? It's in the midst of what, folks? Paradise. So it's in the midst of paradise. Now, turn over there and find out if it's in the midst of paradise. The tree of life is uh, where? It's in the midst of paradise. Now, where do we find the tree of life at? <laughs> Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, 14. And it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates unto the city. What city is that? That's New Jerusalem. So where is paradise? It's in New Jerusalem. Now take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 24 and see where paradise used to be. Luke chapter 24 verse 43 and see where paradise used to be. It's not there anymore. Uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. And it says, uh, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, that very day, shalt thou be with me in what? Paradise. So paradise used to be where? Used to be down in the earth. That same day Jesus Christ went into the center of the earth. He went down below and he preached into the spirits in prison. He went to hell and then he went to paradise. In the Old Testament, in the center of the earth, there's a place called Abraham's bosom. That's paradise. And on the other side, it's called hell. In the Old Testament. So paradise is now not in the earth. That's where an Old Testament saint went. Now, it is where? It is, take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and watch where it is now. Yes. He went to both places. No, not the same time, same three days. He buried for three days and three nights. He buried for three days and three nights. First day he goes down there and preaching the spirits in prison. He takes our sins to hell. That's uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And that's Acts chapter 2. And that's Matthew chapter 12. Now he goes to hell that day. Then he crosses over. He goes here first. So when he dies on the cross of Calvary. And he says to that thief on the cross. This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. That day he was with him in paradise. Paradise is there. And you say, how do you know it's a gall? Because in Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, verse 19 on, he says, the, the rich man in hell looked over there and he saw Lazarus. So that thing is, here's an impassable gall in between them. So the Old Testament saint is here, the Old Testament saint's there, and the men in the hell are there. And you can see a cross there to them. So when he said, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise, that repenting thief went to paradise that day. That day. But turn to Second Corinthians chapter 12 and watch where Paul says paradise is now at. Second Corinthians 12, 4. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And pick up verse 4. 2 Corinthians 12, 4. How that he was caught up to where? Paradise. That's Paul. Paul got caught up there. Paul went all the way up to the third heaven, and up, which is paradise, and turn around and come back down again. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and watch how that place is empty over there in the Old Testament. Paradise is empty and went up there. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Ephesians 4, 8. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, 
He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what was it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Where did he sit, descend to, folks? The lower parts of the earth. He went down here to hell. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 31. He went to hell. He took our sins there. Hebrews chapter 9, last verse in the chapter. He took our sins there. So he died out for our sins, took our sins to hell, preached in his spirits in prisons, and went over to paradise. He said, this day shall thou be with me in paradise. After his resurrection, he takes all the people out of the Old Testament and takes paradise and takes it all the way up to the third heaven. So years later, Paul said, I ascended up to paradise. He went up to heaven, turned around again, and come back down again. He was in both places. In the three days and three nights that he was in the heart of the earth. Matthew chapter 12, Acts chapter 2. He, he spent less time than three days in hell. He said, this day shall thou be with me in paradise. He didn't even spend a full day there. Because he said, this day, that very day, he probably didn't spend that time. That very day, they die, the thief dies, he goes down preaching the Spirit to the prison and comes over the same day. Don't take long to preach a message, boy. <laughs> I told you so. That's about like that. <laughs> there you go. It's pretty close to it, but a little more than that. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, it was something like it. Something like it. Something like it. Be a quiet a message. That's why he has the keys of death and hell. That's why he carries the keys. The three days. The three days. Oh, exactly. He didn't spend full three days there. The three days is down here in the heart of the earth. Didn't say three days in hell. Said three days in the heart of the earth. So the three days is down here. Not three days in hell. Hebrews 9, the last verse in the chapter. And that proves to you that Christ carried our sins to hell. Hebrews chapter 9, the last verse in the chapter says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, had them on him. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. Without it, where in the world did it go if he, he, he's going to appear without it? So the second time when Christ comes back at the advent or the rapture, when he comes back there, he's not going to have any sins. When he comes back here to rapture, no sins. Advent there, no sins. Where'd that sin go? He had them here on the cross of Calvary. He had them here on the cross of Calvary. Where did they go? They had to go somewhere. Because he sure don't have them on him when he comes back. Said without sin. He had them on him. How, you know, how many of you believe he had them on him? Then where did they go? That's the question. Are they up in heaven? The only place they can be is in hell, folks. He ascended. And they said, well, he didn't go to hell. Acts chapter 2 says he went to hell. Says so he went to hell. It's the only place they can be. That's where they ought to be. I would, if a man rejects Christ, he dies in his sin, and he goes to hell with his sin. The abominable whoremongers, all liars, are Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. They're in hell, and their sin's still connected with them, and they still have their sin on them, and they haven't changed one lick when they get there. And they've been there a thousand years, and the sin hasn't changed one iota. Follow that? Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and what verse are we in? I don't know. 7, Revelation 2, 7. All right, uh, paradise of God. Uh, so paradise is now up there in the third heaven. Paradise is actually what? New Jerusalem. Paradise is actually New Jerusalem. 
So when you die, you know where you go? You go to New Jerusalem. Now, I'm, uh, pardon? Hell's still in the middle of the earth, and, but paradise has been changed up there to heaven, up to New Jerusalem. Do you know how many know what New Jerusalem looks like? It's a wonderful city. Oh, man. No shortcuts to heaven, though. <laughs> no shortcuts. Uh, verse 8. And of the angel of the church of Smyrna. Now he's going to write to that one. Right. These things which the, uh, this thing saith the first and the last, which was uh, dead and is alive. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. See the first and last? Look back at chapter 1, verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So they go together. First and the last. All right. Which was dead and is now alive. So there's Jesus Christ there. He's mentioned time after time after time after time in the first three chapters. All right. Which was dead and is alive. I know thy works. Now underline that. That's said about all seven churches. I know thy works. All seven churches get that thing right there. Why? Because it's connected with their salvation. But let's spiritualize it. I know thy works. The Lord knows what you're doing. That's good, brother. That's good. That's good. Because out, way out here in the middle of nowhere, nobody else knows nothing. And nobody else knows you're doing right. The Lord knows you're doing right. But it has a negative aspect too. The Lord knows you're doing bad. I know that works. And tribulation. That can be either the great tribulation or that can be tribulation that Christians go through. Sometimes in the New Testament the word tribulation occurs to a Christian just going through some tribulations. And it ain't the great tribulations. You've got to be careful on which one they're talking about. Alright. Uh, verse 9. Thy poverty, but thou art rich. Now that's a great thing. The Lord knows they're poor, but, but thou art rich. Now ain't that something? Some folks think they're real poor, and they might be real rich. Then, brother, you know what you want to do? You want to be rich toward God. You want to be rich in God's sight. You don't make any difference. You may be poor down here. I bet those folks thought they were poor. I bet they didn't know they was rich. Look at that next that that other church over there in Revelation chapter three, and look at that one there in Revelation chapter three, verse seventeen. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now that's more like to be. Now, brother, if any of these churches fit, the Laodicean church fits us. Because brother, we're rich. Unless you're in some foreign country somewhere. It'd be pretty hard to fit it there. Come on. But it sure fits America good. <laughs> they say they're rich and have need of nothing. And quite often I've said to the Lord, I don't need nothing. And the Lord says, uh, yeah, but are you rich? Do you know that you might be miserable and poor and blinded and naked? And you don't need anything? Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And, uh, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy, underline that word. So this is blasphemy. I know blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, there's some folks that say it. I'm going to apply it to it today. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 7. Some folks say they're Jews and are not. Revelation chapter 7. Put this on to Jehovah's Witness next time you meet one. Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000. You know what the Jehovah's Witness say that is? That say the first 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses that ever become a Jehovah's Witness, that's them. Do you know something? If you put the two verses together, you know what it say the Jehovah's Witness church is? They're a synagogue of Satan. Why? They're not Jews. They're not Jews. They're Gentile, just like you and me. You say, how do you know the 144,000 are Jews? Read 5, 6, and 7. Gives the name of the tribes that they're in. They are Jews. The 144,000 are Jews. Jehovah's Witness says that's them. They're the synagogue of Satan. 
You know who else says they're Jews in this day and age right now? Herbert W. Armstrong. Herbert W. Armstrong says that they're from the ten tribes and they're the, they are the Jews. Worldwide Church of God says they're Jews. They say they're Jews? Okay, now I'll, I'll take your Bible and turn to, turn to Galatians and I'll show you something about this thing. I'll show you where they get it from. Show you where the Jehovah's Witnesses get it from. Herbert W. Armstrong gets it from. And uh, I don't know about Seventh-day Adventists, but where they get it from. And Well, they have taken the Old Testament Jewish promises promised to Israel and put it on themselves. And that's the big problem. Turn to Galatians chapter 3 and watch how they get messed up. Galatians chapter 3. Now let's pick up verse 29. And this is the verse that messes them totally up and this is where they go wrong. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says, And if ye be Christ, you belong to Christ. And they say, well, yes, we're Christians. If ye be Christ, then you... And you'll see what's wrong with that. Being a fact of them being Jews, literal, physical Jews coming from Abraham. What's wrong with it? Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither what? Male nor female. So he's talking about a spiritual thing. He's not talking about a physical thing. So it's not physical Jews he's referring to. He's referring to a spiritual Jew. Then a Christian, if he says, I'm a spiritual Jew, okay. Only if he says, I'm a spiritual Jew. You can say, I'm a spiritual Jew, okay, okay. But if you say, I'm a Jew, oh, now you're a sin of God of Satan. Because you're not a literal Jew. Now, get a couple cross-reference. Romans chapter 2. Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 2. These are the two verses that mess them up. Mess them up so bad that Herbert W. Armstrong went off on it, the uh, Jehovah's Witness went off on it, and you hear, get a Jehovah's Witness say, well, I'm the spiritual Jew, and you give him the twelve tribes, or he say, well, that's me, I'm one of the twelve tribes. Say, what tribe are you from? The Mormons do use it. Mormons use the same thing, and they say, they're, I've heard some of them say, I'm from the tribe of Ephraim. And I said, boy, you sure picked the wrong tribe. You ought to study the tribe of Ephraim. And then I say, you fail to realize the tribe of Ephraim is not in Revelation chapter 7. They don't even know it. Revelation chapter 7, the tribe of Ephraim is not even that. Uh, now turn to Romans chapter 2 and look at verse 29. Watch this thing again. This is how they all get messed off of it. it said the synagogue of Satan. Man says he's a Jew he's, and he's a liar and he's a synagogue of Satan. Some folks got the devil's church. Wouldn't that raise the hair on your head? Find out you've been in the devil church for 20 years. <laughs> or your whole life. And you were saved and you got to the judgment and found out you was in the devil church all your life. Boy, that'd be a mess, wouldn't it? If he gets to heaven. <laughs> yes. Uh, took, turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. You can be saved being in the devil's church. Revelation chapter 17, and look where he says, come out in verse 4, Revelation 18, 4. 18, 4, Revelation 18, 4. And he heard another voice from heaven saying, now underline it, come out of her, what? My people. I mean, say people are in it. And that's a great horror, Revelation chapter 17 and 18. That's a Roman Catholic church. And that saved people in it. Pardon? But they're still saved. They're still saved. Still saved. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4. Now, now underline it in your Bible. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. Chapter 17 and 18 is no doubt about it. Now, to save person in the Catholic Church. 
What does he say? My people. My people. That's a saved person. But that, so what, are they supposed, what is a Catholic supposed to do when he gets saved? Get out of the Church of Rome. But did uh, Billy Graham tell them all to do that? Mm -mm. That's his mistake. He should have told them to leave. But boy, he'd have sure lost a big crowd if he did. <laughs> Come on. Do you say why? It's their doctrine. It's their doctrine. You're not supposed to pray to Mary. Your promise keepers don't tell them to come out either. But then that's how you lose people. When you say, get out! And they lose people. So preachers don't say it. You want, they want people. Why do they want people? They want great big buildings. Because they think that the building proves success. The building don't prove success. If the building burns, that don't mean nothing. So what? It's just a building. All right, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye shall have be tried, and ye shall have, trib have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Didn't say he would give them eternal life, did he? He said he'd give them a crown. So what is this? Right at the margin of the Bible, it's a martyr's crown. It's a martyr's crown. It's a crown for dying for Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus Christ enough to die for him, the Lord going to give you a crown. Do you love him enough to die for him? The Lord will give you a crown for loving him enough to die for him. Now write down the cross reference. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation 12, 11. Revelation 12, 11. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives. I told you a matter of love, didn't I? Loved not their lives unto the death. What do you suppose the death is? Folks, knowing your Bible, knowing the Revelation enough, you know enough Scripture for now, what do you think the death is found in Revelation chapter 11? Uh, they overcome him because they love not, their, uh, love not their lives into the death. What would it be? Now think a minute. There you go. You got it. You got it. So it said, love not their lives unto death. So they said, okay, Lord, we'll go to the place to where you can cut our head off. Well, we love you and we'll and let him and we won't deny you. And if he cuts our head off, he cuts our head off. So they die. So they love not their lives unto the, why a special one? And in Christ trying to get them to take a mark. And they won't take a mark, so they get the head cut off. So it's the death, special one, get the head cut off. Follow that? All right, Revelation chapter 2. Now, there's a lot of martyrs back here in the church age. Back there, boy, a lot of martyrs that died for Jesus. All right, let's find a uh, quitting place. Uh, verse 11. He that hath the ear, let him hear. With the Spirit saith unto the churches, He that overcome shall me not hurt of the second death. Let's quit there. But you ought to have second death. You, have, you should have Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, for the second death. And that is the death of the soul. Well, the death of the soul. Not annihilation. Not annihilation, but death of the soul. The soul still exists, keep right on going, out into hell for eternity. But it's still called death of the soul. All right. Any questions? Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 and verse 6. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14.
and will show you what the second death is. Read all three verses, and it will reveal to you what the second death is. Yes. Evidently, evidently that's what it is. They have ten days to make the decision. It's just like a fellow saying, okay, uh, my whole life depends on this. I'm going to die or I'm going to take a mark. You mean to tell me I've got to do it right now? Okay, I'll give you ten days to make the decision. In the ten days, your head comes off. But boy, Americans, well, you know what Americans do, don't you folks? Pardon? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's what Americans will do. That's a good one. All right, prayer request. Yeah, let's play for Rachel Miller, the young man that she, her friend that she brought with her, uh, up there this summer, died in a car accident. And she's real broken hearted about it. She just re Okay, what else we need to remember and pray? Well, let's not forget to pray for Sharon. Let's pray the Lord would uh, give us some visitors. Don't forget to pray for all of our missionaries. And uh, don't forget to pray for the revival down at Sean's. And don't forget to pray for Sean's wedding. And what else we have to we need to remember in prayer? All right, let's pray for the bus ministry that we'll continue to get some more kids and new kids and keep the ones we got. Let's get to pray for all our Sunday school teachers. All right, let's pray for Charlotte. Got a lot of flus going on. A lot of people are real sick with the flu. It lasts three or four days or more. Last pretty near five days. <coughs> it's hard. I still got it. It lasts for months, really. The worst part's the first five days, but it's still unbelievably it stays right there. I've never had one that stayed there that long. And I worked and sweat and did all kinds of stuff, but it's still up. All right, let's uh, pray that the Lord will give us a, a blessing this Sunday. The Lord will bless the preacher and give us a blessing for Sunday. So what else do we need to remember in prayer? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would hear our prayers, Father, and I pray that you would answer them according to your will. And uh, Lord, bless our prayer meeting even now, Father. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen.